Extreme Rules 2017 is officially in the books. Or, as you might want to refer to this pay-per-view, what's our rules? I mean, seriously. What the hell were they doing? Like, as fans, you're sitting there and thinking to yourself, it's called Extreme Rules, but it says anything but extreme. And then for several of these matches, you feel like you needed a multiple paragraph explanation of the rules and stipulations of the damn match. It was ridiculous. I have no idea what the hell the WWE was doing for so much of the show. For example, you kick off with an icy title match where if the babyface champion gets disqualified, they lose the title. Which if you actually have an edgy kind of tweener guy or an edgy babyface guy, that can work. But with... Wash your ass, Dean Ambrose, it makes no freaking sense. And then you sit there and have the stipulation, and you take 15 minutes to get to the goddamn point. 15 minutes just to get to the point. It's like when you're waiting for your lady to fucking nut. Like, I've done it three times already. It's been 15 minutes. ta 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 day, Junior. It ain't me, it's you. Wasting all that damn time. That's what that match felt like. And we've got a Raw Women's Championship match. Anything on a pole. Nuff said. Hashtag Vince Russo. But we have a kendo stick on a pole match where only one person can actually use the kendo stick. The hell? Why complicated and convoluted so damn much? We've got a steel cage match for the Raw Tag Team Championship where one of the combatants escapes the steel cage then comes back in to where only they have to escape it a second time. Why the hell do they have to escape it a second time? They've already escaped it once. And then you've got a submission match for the Cruiserweight Championship where the referee is using five counts and ten counts. This is a submission match. The only way this match is supposed to end is if somebody taps out or is choked out or can't get up. But we're sitting there doing five and ten counts when both of the guys are outside of the ring? Who books this shit? I look at it this way. The less the wrestling fan has to think, the better. Believe me. Just look at what we say on videos, on, in comments, and especially on social media. On forums, on reddits. The less we think, the better. However, you put the fans in a situation where that's all they're doing throughout the show. Makes it really hard to enjoy the show. Because if the commentators are confused about what the hell is going on, how the hell can they effectively sell the match? If the wrestlers look confused, because frankly I think they are confused, how the hell are they supposed to be able to effectively work the match? And if the referees, the guys that are supposed to sit there and officiate the match and therefore know the rules of what is going on, if they don't know the damn rules, then who the hell does? And if they're all confused, what the fuck are fans supposed to think? You're just confused. And sometimes with professional wrestling, I think it's important to keep it simple stupid. It really is the way to go. Not necessarily for presidencies or journalists, but for professional wrestling, indeed. If the show's called Extreme Rules, then use easy-to-understand extreme match stipulations. Hell in a cell. You know how this works. Tables match, we know how that works. Ladder match, we know how that works. Falls count anywhere match, we know how that works. No DQ match, know how it works. Chairs match, know how it works. Strat match, know how it works. All of these e ambulance matches, all these different things that you could do that are pretty easy to understand. And the WWE went to great lengths to convolute the ever-loving piss out of this. Ding dong, dumb dicks. You overcomplicated something that was so simple, like an Extreme Rules type of pay-per-view should be really hard in theory to screw up because you can do so many more things. You can get those cheap, easy thrills and pops. But when you spend so much time trying to make it as difficult as damn possible, it's going to really negatively impact the show and consequently negatively impact the viewers and their enjoyment of the show. If it's not easy to follow, then don't do it, period. And overall, when you look at this show, except for the ending, it really looked like this company didn't know what the hell they were doing, which of course should come as no surprise to most of us.
So let's actually talk about the matches on this show. We kicked off the show with the aforementioned IC title match. And, and seriously, when you look at Dean Ambrose four or five years ago, so many people were pumping him full of smoke, talking about how he's the next big thing. He's going to be the next CM Punk. He's compared to Roddy Piper and Terry Funk. I bought into some of that bullshit. Because you looked at it and you assume what's gotten to the WWE program, he would learn how to be a WWE talent, and possibilities were endless. This is a guy that could talk on the mic. He was a little bit different. And then you realize almost five years later, he's done nothing but regress. This dude is terrible. He is awful. And he smells like shit. You can just sense it. You can see it. Hashtag wash your ass, Ambrose. You can put up with the stank from you if you didn't stink so bad as a performer. You are terrible. Anybody that used to pump up John Moxley has to be ashamed of themselves. And what's really sad about all of this is that if you found out tomorrow that Dean Ambrose was future endeavor, you'd be like, eh. And that's exactly it. And it's kind of like this match for the first 15 minutes. It was just 15 minutes of random shit to ultimately get to the five minutes that mattered where they actually did a good job of tying into the stipulation. And all I care about at this point is that the right guy won. Miz, you better wash that damn bell. It's time to celebrate, bitches. You know what's funny is the mixed tag match was the match I probably gave the fewest shits about on this card, period, and for good reason. You've got Sasha Banks is now playing backup bitch. But the ironic thing about it is, is this match ended up being one of my highlights of the night because in part the backup bitches, Sasha Banks and Alicia Fox, carried the freaking match. You know, the crowd actually legitimately popped when Sasha and Rich Swan won. This match was fun. And where the real fun came for me was afterwards. How crazy is it that Sasha Banks is related to Snoop? And she has no rhythm. She has the dance moves and, mind you, the hairline of a mid-40s white male. You don't believe me? Seriously. Y'all know I'm right. And in fact, if you don't believe me, I'm going to prove it. I'm a white guy. I'll peep my hairline game. You know, I'm 36. It's not the same hairline I had six, seven years ago quite when I started doing this. But it's still pretty damn good for my age. A lot closer to 40 than I am 30. And for a lot of you fucks, you wish you had this hairline at 26, let alone 36. And in particular, Sasha Banks most certainly wishes with her bald-headed ass that she had this hairline. So as a 36-year-old white dude with this hairline, I feel like I'm a good resource for understanding what a mid-40s white guy's dance moves look like. So let me go ahead and demonstrate for you, if you don't mind. If you don't mind. Just to give you an idea. And furthermore, furthermore, you can feel free to chime in in the comments section who you think did it better. Hashtag Sasha or hashtag Schlegdaddy. Now personally, I know who the winner's going to be. But, but, but let's let things play out. Are you ready? You'll see the similarities. Let's go. We're going to kick it off with something real nice. We call it the spring break. Now we just do all types of crazy white people things. Tell me who did it better, Sasha or the Schlegg Daddy. I thought so. I tell you, nobody does white boy dancing better than white boys. Sasha Banks, nice try, but back it up, bitch, and let the experts handle it, period. Hashtag Banks buried. Anyways, moving on. Speaking of buried, the Raw Women's Championship match. Kendo stick on a pole match. I'm sure Vince Russo got a Brooklyn-sized boner to this shit. Oh my God, this was terrible. Terrible. You could argue this was every bit as cringeworthy as the This Is Your Life segment from Raw on Monday night. I'll have to admit, 
I got great glee and rapture out of listening to the crowd boo the fuck out of Bailey. You want to talk about WWE's creative team really screwing a talent over? I give you babyface Bailey. But at least people are now starting to see the real truth is that she's a much better heel than she is a babyface because she's not that great and she is annoying as fuck. And the way the company has featured her has made her even more annoying as fuck. Why in the hell would you boo cheer her at this point in time? You have no choice but to boo her. But man, give us a real reason to boo her and let's try to make something out of it. Um, because you're not making anything out of her right now. Um, and you certainly weren't making anything out of this match. I mean, granted, Alexa Bliss, she has personality, charisma. She has that kind of it factor all day. And you throw it in here, though, she's still shit in the ring. And this match was terrible. Clearly, it was intentionally designed to be short because they didn't want this match to bomb like this was your life had bombed. I don't know if it was going to bomb that bad. But again, Alexa Bliss stinks. And even she would find a way to make a kendo stick on a pole match be even worse than it potentially should be. This was bad. And at least we're done with this shit. And in fact, I'm going to move this review right along and introduce you to one of the newest members of the OTRS Central crew. Ladies and gentlemen, I bring to you the Lonely Wrestling Fan. One, two, one, two, three, four. I'm just a YouTube guy helping you find your way. The fun it has been lost no matter what they say. Mm -hmm. You all know it's true, you do. It doesn't have to be. Mm -mm. If you want some answers, then put your faith in me. Oh yeah, cause the off the rope show is back. Mm -hmm. The journey's just begun. Make wrestling fun again. Is the job number one mm -hmm. for this job? I am the right man. What the YWC needs is the lonely wrestling fan. Ladies and gentlemen, the lonely wrestling fan. And fuck you, Chris Jericho. Anyways, moving on. Tag Team Championship Steel Cage match. This match was fucking weird. Absolutely weird. It had a weird vibe about it. Of all the match types you would associate with the Hardys, why in the fuck would they choose a Steel Cage match, but let alone they did? It was weird that they chose the only way to win was the escape. I like that. And I really liked how these guys played to the cage, actually played to the stipulation of the match pretty much throughout the entirety of the match. Like these guys, it's almost like they know how to work and they went out to work. But it's unfortunate because the WWE seems to be giving the Hardys the Dudley Boy treatment and that's not a good thing. Then you get all types of confused because why would somebody be able to escape the cage only to come back in and then it doesn't count and we never really got a full explanation. It's like, what the fuck is going on here? I just don't know. Um, these guys tried, and they went out there and busted their ass, and like I said, in theory, they did a really good job of working to the cage, but ultimately, it doesn't change the fact that the stipulation was stupid. Ultimately, it doesn't change the fact that, frankly, this feud was stupid, and it really doesn't change the fact that the wrong team winning was stupid. There was no reason to take the belts off of the Hardys at this point in time. Absolutely none. Why the hell would you go there? You didn't need to, so don't. People are buying in to the Hardys as champions, let them get a little bit of a run and do something better with them. And that's why it felt like, in large part, the crowd completely cropped on this when the finish happened, because they were pissed off that the Hardys lost. It was, just, it was just weird. I don't want to shit on these guys too much, because in terms of the actual work of incorporating the stipulation of a fucking match into said fucking match, these guys did an outstanding job. And they built the suspense and drama, but so many things about it were just off and flat out stupid. Just like our next guest, apparently he patterns himself as 
Finn Balor's number one fan. Uh, I want to introduce to you another new member of the OTR Central crew, and his name is Finn de Calor. Excuse me, Finn de Calor. Apparently the heat ends. We'll see what he's got. Mark is smart here, and I don't know if it's this extra medium Nirvana shirt that does it, but I gotta tell ya, fin de calor, he's got mucho mucho dinero written all over him. I promise you. En fuego. He understands the greatness of Finn Balor, and who wouldn't? And just thinking about Finn Balor make, makes me put juice all over myself. Uh, I guess it, it gives new meaning to the term spot monkey. Oh, Finn Balor, I know you, you didn't have your time on Sunday, but soon enough the world will see, and the Shrek Daddy especially will know it to be true, that you are a legit opponent for Brock Lesnar, and you deserve to have that universal championship around your Calvin Klein model waist once again, because you know it's true, Finn Balor is one of the best motherfucking wrestlers in the world. All new meaning to the term spot monkey indeed. Enough of that shit. Let's get serious and close out this review already, shall we? The Cruiserweight Championship. You know, what I don't understand is the WWE intentionally tries to sabotage these guys. If you don't care about them, then don't have them. If you are going to have them and use them, use them appropriately. Stop having so many of your goddamn cruiserweights with submission maneuvers as their finisher. Furthermore, don't book a cruiserweight championship match to be, especially the culmination of a feud between Austin Aries and Neville that has been going on since the road to WrestleMania. Do not book them in a damn submission match. This shit should be two out of three falls. This should be all types of flaming shards of ass glass and flips and kicks and all types of high spots and shit. That's what the cruiserweight division is supposed to be. That's the type of action you're supposed to get from the cruiserweight division. They're not supposed to be trying to slow things down and submit each other, tap each other out, choke each other out. That's dumb. Period. We're in a fucked up place where the big guys wrestle like cruiserweights and the cruiserweights wrestle like the freaking super heavyweights. It's ridiculous. And these guys tried and tried and tried. But let's be honest, the crowd really didn't care. And at one point in time, it seemed like they were almost getting borderline hostile towards it. You know, Neville's done everything he can as that heel cruiserweight champion. But goddamn. That company doesn't put you in situations that are beneficial to you. It's only going to hurt you. And this match was hurt so desperately by the fact this is supposed to be a big, exciting blow-off to a feud that's been going on since before WrestleMania. And it's a fucking submission match. A cruiserweight division match. A submission match. Who books this shit? I often say with professional wrestling shows, especially the special events, the pay-per-views, it's not always about how you start. It's about how you finish. It's, it's like sex for a guy. It doesn't matter how good it was along the way. Ultimately, did you get your nut? If you got your nut, that's all that matters. That's all you're thinking about. Period. Fellas, you know what the fuck I'm talking about. Maybe at least some of you. But anyways. The main event of this show. The Fatal Five Way Number One Contenders Match. Up to this point in time in the show... I was like, this crap was dumb, it was weird, it was stupid, it was horribly executed, but this match saved so much of the night for me. I had so much fun watching this shit. It was crash test dummies and all types of shit. 
This felt like a main event. It felt like a big fucking deal. It felt like these guys were going out there to try and kill each other to get what was the most important opportunity they had facing them, which was a universal title shot against, of all people, Brock fucking Lesnar. This match was booked away, in my opinion, exactly how the hell it should have been booked. It felt like a massive deal. It really, truly did. And what made it even more over the top for me is even more special for me is that fucking Finn Balor lost. Someday you want to come back to him in the world title picture, fine. But let's actually truly get him over and let's actually build him up to a point where it can no longer be denied. Right now, it can be denied. So we need to deny his ass. And I cannot tell you how much I popped when not only did Finn Balor not win, he's the one that ultimately ate it at the hands of fucking Samoa Joe. Going into this match, to me, the only real viable option you had for the next opponent for Brock Lesnar was Samoa Joe. And the WWE went there. A guy who, many years back, in a wrestling territory far, far away, was getting kidnapped by ninjas, is now main eventing WWE pay-per-views and winning number one contender matches for the right to go on and face Brock Lesnar. Samoa Joe is one of the few legitimate people you have in that company that you actually would care to see him face Brock Lesnar and or would actually be somewhat believable that he could give a Brock Lesnar a freaking run for his money. You got him, you got Strowman, whether you want to admit it or not, Roman Reigns. It might not be the one you want to see, but you could at least believe that a Roman Reigns could beat a Brock Lesnar. Braun Strowman, you might want to see, and you could definitely believe it. But Samoa Joe, you definitely, I think, would want to see this, and you definitely could believe it. There are so many freaking reasons why Samoa Joe was the right choice here. There are so many reasons why Samoa Joe was the only logical choice here. There are so many reasons why Samoa Joe is a vastly superior option to Finn Balor. And I cannot tell you how geeked I am at the thought of seeing what I hope is a multi-match program multi-match program between Samoa Joe and Brock Lesnar for all this kitty dumb shit, for all the flippy, twisty, kicky crap that I don't really care for all that often. Giving me something where it's one real badass dude against another real badass dude. Now that's something that I can get down with. That's something that can help to hashtag make wrestling fun again. Now with that said, Extreme Rules was not a great show. The main event bailed it out a lot for me. But oh, what a main event. And what a finish. At least if anything else, it made me glad that I took the three hours or so to watch Extreme Rules on Sunday. And I cannot tell you in recent years with WWE how rare of an occurrence that has actually been. That's a good thing. That's a positive. And now, Lyman. Goodness gracious, great balls of fire.